So uh, I guess now we know why we might want to do paleoclimate uh, studies in corals, and I guess we know a little bit about how corals uh, form their skeletons. Um, so uh, this uh, video will be about some of the, the proxies um, uh, that can uh, be used in those coral skeletons. We're going to start off uh, in this video with um, those that use um, isotopes. Um, yeah, so I guess we've, we've, we've covered uh, coral calcification, uh, how the skeleton is formed, uh, and uh, I guess we, we went over a little bit of the, I guess, the chemistry. So the calcium uh, skeleton is this um, mineral aragonite, uh, which is made up of calcium, carbon, and oxygen. Uh, this, uh, calcium carbonate. Um, and the oxygen uh, atoms can uh, be different isotopes of, of oxygen, and we'll look at how those uh, uh, vary, what causes that variation uh, in this video. We'll also look a little bit about uh, how uh, the carbon atoms um, can, be, can be different uh, and how we can use those as maybe proxies. Uh, and in a subsequent uh, video, we'll also look at um, uh, the other things that can substitute in, other elements that can substitute in for calcium, but that's, that's for a different video. Uh, now, this will be mostly in the, the mineral phase of the coral in the calcium carbonate, but we'll also consider that the carbon um, components of the, of the coral calcium will also include some organic material. So we'll come on to that as well towards the uh, latter end of the old uh, video I really discussed about. Um, so just a, a quick uh, primer on, on isotopes. So if you have, a, I guess, a chemistry or a physics background, then you might want to kind of skip ahead a little bit uh, for this, because it should be uh, fairly familiar to you. Uh, but uh, if you're not, then fun times, we're going to learn about isotopes. Um, so uh, oxygen, uh, the element oxygen uh, has uh, three, uh, well, actually has more than three uh, isotopes. It has three uh, that are non-radioactive, it has three isotopes. And what that means is that they, uh, the, the atoms have the same number of protons in the nucleus. Um, so if I just mix up the old uh, pen, pen, here we go. So nucleus here. Uh, of each of these um, uh, of atoms, I should point out that what I've what I've um, I've got shown here are actually three water molecules. So an oxygen atom uh, with a covalently bonded hydrogen. Uh, this is a this is a hydrogen nucleus here, here, and this is the oxygen in the middle. Oxygen, I guess, on there. Um, uh, so uh, these are three water molecules, and the only thing that's different is that the atoms of oxygen in each molecule. Is slightly different. Okay, so they're different in that they have uh, they have a different number of neutrons in their nucleus. So they have the same number of protons. They've got eight protons, uh, which means they have eight uh, electrons. Uh, uh, which, if I guess if you're I guess familiar uh, with chemistry, so chemistry is really the interactions of electrons around atoms with other electrons. That's all. Chemistry and all about electrons. So you'll see the, the electronic configuration of these molecules is the same. So you might expect uh, the chemistry of each of these different, uh, I guess, isotopes of oxygen uh, in these water molecules to be the same. And uh, I guess the first approximation, that's true. So water with um, uh, that was all made of oxygen 16 would behave, would, 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 would still look like water that was made with. Uh, oxygen 18. Uh, the only thing that would be different, uh, that would be kind of obvious, I guess, to the touch or would be measurable uh, if you're a high school student, would be that the, the, the oxygen um, 18 is, is heavier. It's got more neutrons in, so it's got more mass per atom. Um, so if we, if we, oh, uh, let's get rid of that scroll that I did earlier. There we go. Um, so if we look at uh, how those different isotopes of, uh, of oxygen might be distributed between um, some different chemicals. So we've got a reaction here, um, calcium. Uh, calcium oh, I'll give myself a, myself a pointer, try uh, pointer. Um, uh, options. Laser pointer, that was it. So, so we've got uh, calcium, we've got um, uh, bicarbonate, and that can react to form calcium carbonate and um, CO2 and water. Sometimes you might see this written as carbonic acid, which this, these two species can react into. Anyway, uh, you can see that each of these different compounds, except calcium, 
Um, they all contain uh, oxygen. Um, so if the, the, there was no kind of chemical uh, difference in the behavior of these different isotopes, uh, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18, uh, then you might expect them to be uh, effectively uniformly distributed uh, between these different kind of uh, compounds. So um, most of the oxygen uh, that exists uh, on Earth is uh, oxygen 16, and then there's a small amount, 0.2% of oxygen is oxygen 18. So we might expect that that's that ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18, that would be the same in each of these different um, um, uh, compounds. Now it turns out uh, that, um, well, we're just gonna look at um, calcium uh, and water, I'm oh, sorry, calcium carbonate and water. It turns out that, that isotopes can effectively exchange between uh, these different compounds. And again, if there was no um, preference for any one of the isotopes to be in any one of these different um, compounds, because they should have identical chemistry, then they should be uniformly distributed. Uh, and it wouldn't matter if maybe an oxygen uh, 16 could, could exchange from the calcium carbonate, this reaction could maybe go backwards and then forwards again, and that, that, that oxygen 16 could end up on the water molecule, or it could end up on the CO2 molecule. There'd be constant exchange of isotopes because this reaction is going backwards and forwards um, uh, and the, the isotope should be should be kind of very well distributed. Uh, now as it turns out that's not true. Okay so it turns out that there actually is uh, a small preference for the heavier isotopes to be concentrated a little bit more in some of the different compounds. Uh, and in the case of, of calcium carbonate and water, there's a slight preference for the heavier isotope to be uh, bound up in the uh, calcium carbonate compared to in the water. And this is all because of uh, the actual bond strength of all of the, these, uh, between these, these atoms in um, uh, the, uh, uh, the bond strength of the atoms in the, um, in the different compounds. Uh, is partially uh, a result of the vibration of, of atoms between those in those bonds. And the vibration is dependent on the masses of uh, those, um, those atoms. So because there's a difference in the masses, there's a difference in the vibrational energy of the bonds, which means there's a slight difference in bond strengths, which means that some uh, isotopes get preferentially kind of put into different compounds, which leaves there the, to be a small preference in the amount of calcium uh, of oxygen 18 in calcium carbonate over that in water, if this reaction could go kind of constantly backwards and forwards or forwards and backwards so that the isotopes could be uh, as exchanged freely as they could between all the different species. So another thing that um, I guess we need to just uh, uh, mention uh, or, uh, or explain is that the, the, the notation for um, uh, using isotopes in, in geochemistry uses this, what we call this delta notation. So you'll see that if we click back to the actual abundances, uh, so oxygen uh, um, has got, I guess, three isotopes. Uh, and if we were looking at the ratio, I guess as, as defined down at the bottom here, we've got 18 over oxygen 16. Um, if we actually wanted to measure that, okay, that would be 0.2 divided by 99.76. I have no idea what the actual number is, but it would be some very small number that's quite hard to, to see small differences in that ratio. So because the ratios are quite often extreme in isotope geochemistry, and also that the changes in isotope ratio between one sample and another are actually very small, uh, rather than use the absolute ratios, we use uh, this notation. Um, so we basically have this notation, which is this lowercase Greek delta, and then a superscript, which is uh, usually the heavier of the two isotopes in the ratio, and then the element uh, that we are um, looking at. Uh, and the, the, the delta kind of value or delta notation what that basically means is it's a part per thousand change 
in the isotope ratio relative to some arbitrary kind of standard. So we, we with each isotope system, everyone agrees to measure the same standard material, and that's in the case of oxygen isotopes measured in water. It's um, some uh, it's actually buckets of water uh, that was it's not a bucket, it's sealed vials of water that were uh, basically sampled to represent the average ocean, and they're kept in uh, um, the I think it's the International Atomic Energy Authority in Vienna, IAEA. Anyway, it's in Vienna, so it's called Vienna Standard Mean Ocean Water. Uh, and there's also uh, for oxygen isotopes measured in, in carbonates, there's a, a standard carbonate powder that's also conveniently kept in Vienna. Uh, uh, so we measure the isotope ratio in that standard, and we measure the isotope ratio in a sample that we're interested in, in knowing, and we basically just note the difference. So this, this part of the equation here is the difference uh, in isotope ratio divided by the actual isotope ratio, uh, and then times it by a thousand. We times it by a thousand um, because the ratios are, the differences in ratios are tend to be very small. Um, you can think of it as, it's effectively like how you calculate percent difference. Uh, instead of using times by 100 in percent, we're times it by 1,000. So you'll see this, this delta notation quite a lot in, in isotope um, uh, reconstruction. Um, so let's have a look now at uh, 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 how this, this, this system might work in kind of reality. So we're, we're looking at, uh, we've got uh, um, uh, some isotopes in water and some isotopes in, in, in calcium carbonate. Uh, uh, and there's an exchange between all of these different things. So we've got this simplified equation, I guess, here. Okay. Whereas um, the uh, um, calcium carbonate is here and water is here. But actually, we, we need to consider that there are lots of other exchanges that the, the water isn't actually constantly exchanging with the calcium carbonate because this is of course a solid, and this is a liquid. Um, so once the coral skeleton has formed, there is actually no way of exchanging the isotopes freely within the different compounds. Um, so actually the, the species that's, that's doing the exchanging and actually the, the exchange actually really only happens at the moment at which the, 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 the crystals are forming. Uh, and actually, the crystals are not forming from water, they're forming from the carbonate ion, or maybe the bicarbonate ion. Um, so we might need to also include all of the uh, isotope exchanges between all of these different processes over here on the whole right-hand side. Uh, so between CO2 and water forming carbonic acid, carbonic acid and bicarbonate, and then maybe that gets incorporated into the calcium carbonate, Maybe if the mechanism for calcium carbonate production uses the carbonate ion, it'll have to use this other one as well. So that, that uh, even though there might not be a direct exchange between water and calcium carbonate, the isotopes will eventually be able to exchange between the species freely, so long as the crystals are growing slowly enough that the isotopes can exchange. Um, so let's have a look at uh, water to start off with. I mean, we've, I've been talking about an exchange of isotopes between water and the calcium carbonate, but what might determine what, how might the isotopes of, of water change? So in, in, I guess in most of, I guess, the tropical ocean, uh, there are two uh, forms of, of water. There's the liquid water, and then above that, uh, there is the atmosphere, which will have uh, gaseous water. Um, so that water will constantly be uh, evaporating and condensing back down, so there'll be an exchange between the gas and the liquid. Um, so the isotopes that are, that, are, that are in the water phase can freely exchange with those in the gas phase. Now, um, so that's kind of uh, demonstrated by uh, these, uh, where's my little mouse pointer gone? These uh, exchange here. So oxygen 18 in the gas phase, can, can exchange with oxygen 16 in the um, liquid phase and they can switch a route quite free. Um, and as it turns out that again, just like with water and calcium carbonate, there is a slight preference 
for the heavier isotopes to be held in the uh, water. And this is because uh, water uh, has a slightly stronger bonding environment than uh, water vapor, or liquid water has a slightly stronger bonding environment, or rather that bonding environment than um, the gaseous form. Um, so there's a small um, one, well, nine parts in a thousand um, enrichment in the water compared to uh, gas. So if I had a, um, I guess, a sealed bottle uh, half full of, of water, and the rest of it had water vapor in it, uh, and I was to measure the the isotope ratios of those those three, um, and I would find that the the um, the water vapor would be slightly isotopically lighter than the um, water that's uh, underneath it. Um, so let's have a look at what would happen, what how this affects um, the ocean. So uh, if we have a look at the panel over on the right hand side first, so um, I mentioned that the standard for um, oxygen isotopes measured in water is this pot of water that's kept in Vienna that's supposedly quite close to the, the uh, average ocean. And you can see on these plots here that actually there's lots of variability in the oxygen isotope composition. So uh, this delta 18O, the subscript and the, the Greek lettering thing, it hasn't quite worked out so well on these plots. Um, this this should be, uh, each of the axes here should be, ooh, should be, uh, ah, that's, that's uh, that's not good. That's uh, delta 18O. That's what all these axes should be. Anyway, um, so uh, the average ocean should have a uh, an isotope value of around zero because it's measured relative to uh, a standard that's supposedly the average ocean. Um, now, if we were to evaporate uh, water from uh, the average ocean, uh, that uh, water that evaporates, the water vapour, should be slightly enriched in the lighter isotope. So that means with this delta notation, it should have a uh, slightly negative delta 18O. Uh, and it should be uh, negative by around 9 parts. So it should be around here. And because it's evaporating from the ocean, uh, the salinity, so uh, salinity is along the bottom here, salinity, so it's not salty because it's evaporated from the ocean and that's effectively distilling it, so it should have a salinity of, of zero. So if we look at the average ocean, so the average ocean has got a salinity of 30 something over here. Actually, my plot is kind of over here like this. So if we were to take an average ocean and evaporate water from that, so if we evaporate water, that should increase the salinity of what remains. But we're also, the process of evaporation is preferentially removing the lighter isotopes. So we're actually taking this composition away from this composition. Uh, so we increase both the salinity and we enrich the remaining water in these heavy isotopes. And you can see this array of data here. I'll just get rid of all my annotations. This array of data here, that seems to be going off in that same direction, away from isotopic composition of um, uh, evaporated water. Uh, and these data here are all from the Red Sea. So the Red Sea is uh, characterized because it's, by it's, it's an enclosed basin. So it doesn't really have any large rivers flowing into it. Uh, water enters at the uh, southeast end, uh, and then effectively it just evaporates. And then it's replenished by more seawater flowing in. So uh, it's an evaporated basin. So that kind of uh, explains that the trend here we're seeing in, um, in the isotopes correlating very well with salinity in the Red Sea. Now, if we have a look at other parts of the ocean, we get a much larger spread of data. So if we look at the tropical ocean here in the middle, here, um, if we think about what's happening to that evaporated water, okay, it doesn't just stay up in the atmosphere, um, eventually rains back down again. Um, that could be over land and then flow out into rivers, or it can uh, evaporate, it can um, uh, uh, rain straight back down into the ocean. And you'll remember that the, the water that evaporated had a composition of something like this. Now, when you condense water, you're effectively doing this, this process in reverse. So the, the condensation process 
preferentially removes out of the evaporated water the heavier isotopes because they tend to form the, the condensates. Um, so that leads us, we don't quite go back to, to the average composition of the ocean because we don't actually uh, rain out all of the, the, the evaporated water. So that leaves us kind of rain in the tropics has a composition of around this, obviously with a salinity of zero. So if we're mixing together kind of salty water that's got um, heavy isotopes in it with fresh water that's got lighter isotopes in it, we can get this array of um, uh, isotope compositions, which are basically a mixture between rainwater and evaporated salty water, uh, which then allows us to, to think about, well, maybe we can start to use our measurements of um, oxygen isotopes. If we can measure the oxygen isotopes in the water, we could basically read off and Obviously, there would be some 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 error bounds on this, obviously as well. Uh, we could estimate uh, the salinity, and that seems to work quite well in the tropics. Uh, when you start going up to uh, uh, higher latitudes, so these data here are from um, the polar regions in the north, uh, and I think these these data here are the mostly the North Pacific. So different regions of the Earth they have different isotope compositions of their rain rain. So the polar rainfall is even more isotopically uh, light, whereas uh, Pacific rainfall might be a bit, um, kind of a uh, little bit less isotopically light here. Uh, so in different regions, we might be able to start to draw different calibration lines between oxygen isotopes and salinity. So in a given region, we might be able to use oxygen isotopes as a as a proxy measurement for salinity. Now. The modern ocean we would never do this this would be a really silly way of measuring salinity because it's a lot easier to measure salinity than it is to measure oxygen isotopes and also you can see from the spread of these correlations this spread of correlations here that there's actually uh, a great deal of inaccuracy uh sorry imprecision uh when we actually do that calibration but nonetheless uh, we can maybe think about using this into the past because in the past we don't have the salinity preserved because the water no longer exists from the past. It's kind of moved away. Uh, whereas the oxygen isotopes may be preserved in some way uh, in the calcium carbonate. Um, so there we are. So to, to summarize here that the, the oxygen isotopes should change with salinity of water and the heavier oxygen isotopes, so the heavier is more positive delta 18 O, so it's heavy and should correlate with salty, salty, and we get a nice calibration line. Okay. Um, right. So let's have a look now about another way that isotopes can can change in these different kind of compounds. So we've already uh, shown that, uh, well, I've, I've told you that the isotopes are not evenly distributed between all of the different compounds in any kind of chemical. Uh, uh, reaction. So this this isotope exchange we have here at the top. This is exchanging water, uh, exchanging isotope, isotopes between water and calcium carbonate, and that oxygen eighteen could be in the calcium carbonate, or it might want to be in the water. Like this now this isn't the actual chemical reaction. This is just a representation of how isotopes might exchange between these two compounds, um, even though the actual exchange might involve a whole bunch of different. Um, so uh, we can observe the results of this isotope exchange uh, is that there is some preference, in this case, a just over 3% preference for the, the heavier oxygen 18 being in the calcium carbonate. So this is, there'll be more 18O in here and less 18O in that water down here. So this means that this. If we were to measure the, the calcium carbonate, this would have a delta 18O that's more positive, and this would have a delta 18O that's less positive, so it's probably more negative in some sense. Uh, yeah, so that's one of those horrible annotations. Um, so we want to think now about what actually is driving 
that's fractionation. So uh, we can think of this um, kind of isotope exchange like we would think of any chemical reaction. Okay, but even though it's not a chemical reaction, it's just kind of a representation of exchange of isotopes. Um, we can we can we can write out it as if it were a chemical reaction and give it a equilibrium constant. Okay. Now, in the types of isotope uh, exchange reactions, this is sometimes, like it, quite often, given this term alpha, which is the fractionation factor rather than the equilibrium constant, but you can think of the two as, as, as similar. So in um, chemical uh, reactions, we've got uh, some, I guess, difference in, in the um, products and, and reactants. Um, and we have a, a uh, an equilibrium constant, K, in our case, a fractionation factor. Uh, and if um, uh, if this is not one, then there must be something that's causing it to not be one. If, if the isotopes were just uniformly distributed over all of the different chemical species, then the fractionation factor should be one. Now it's not one, so what's driving it? Now in, uh, I guess, in the thermodynamics of uh, chemical reactions, we can express the uh, driving uh, free energy of reaction uh, and relate that to um, the equilibrium constant. And we can just write that out in the same way here, but just replacing that fractionation factor, we're replacing the equilibrium constant here, just getting rid of that and calling that alpha. That's what we've done here. Okay. Now, uh, the delta G is uh, a combination, that free energy is a combination of the uh, enthalpy of that reaction. Um, so there's, that is the, I guess, the energy difference that's driving the heavier isotope to favor being in this compound that's got the stronger uh, chemical bonds. Uh, and then acting kind of against that thing that wants to separate out the isotopes is the entropy of mixing. So uh, if there were no other kind of uh, factors, then the isotopes would want to be evenly mixed across uh, the two things. So that is described uh, here. Now, I guess you don't need to really worry about that so much, but all you, the, the, the thing that is most important is actually that this relationship between the free energy here and the fractionation factor is temperature dependent. So if we were to, to rearrange that, we could come up with some expression for how the fractionation factor, so basically how different are the isotope ratios in the two different phases. So how different is the calcium carbonate isotope ratio to the water isotope ratio is proportional to one over the temperature. So that means that when the temperature is very, very high, there's a small relative difference between the isotope ratios. Uh, and when it temperature is very low, this uh, alpha term can be larger. Okay, and that makes sense in terms of this delta G equation here, because at high temperatures, entropy of mixing is going to win out. It's got a temperature term. So the higher temperature is, the more equally mixed all of the isotopes will be amongst all the different phases. It's quite easy to kind of like conceptualize that in terms of when you heat things up it kind of mixes better. Whereas at lower temperatures the isotopes are going to more preferentially kind of fractionate out into the different phases that they're kind of they, they most preferentially kind of like to be in based on the differences in their bond strengths. Um, now a little caveat to this is that all of this kind of like wonderful thermodynamics that's going to tell us that we can use this as a temperature proxy over here, here, this assumes that we can easily exchange uh, isotopes between the calcium carbonate and the water, and they can exchange backwards and forwards to the heart content. Now, if we actually look at what the water and the calcium carbonate have to do for there to be isotope exchange with them. So uh, first of all, uh, we have to go through all of these different equilibria at the top here, so we can exchange our water 
or the oxygen in our water with the oxygen that's in our bicarbonate. Okay, so that's got to exchange backwards and forwards. Um, and that's obviously not uh, trivial. Um, and then also, if this water is in the ocean, so if this is some lovely water here, that has to exchange it uh, not only through all of these reactions here, but it's got to somehow uh, get through all of this cell, uh, through this calcification process into this solid um, calcium carbonate mineral as part of the column of the skeleton. And then for it to be an ice step exchange, it has to go back out again, right? There's no way, absolutely no way that this uh, it happens. There's no way that these things can actually exchange freely between them. Um, but uh, we can get around that problem uh, by using um, some empirical um, calibrations. Because when we actually go out and, and look at different uh, corals and uh, measure their uh, oxygen isotopes preserved in their skeletons and uh, measure the temperature at which they're forming those skeletons, uh, we find that we do get uh, this quite nice uh, inverse relationship between the temperature and the uh, delta 18 O. Okay. So we, we, we do see this difference. Uh, so when temperature goes um, up, so this is temperature increase, okay, we're actually getting uh, uh, a, um, a decrease. Here we go, all these are decreasing as temperature goes up, decreasing in terms of their delta 18 O. So we're actually getting lighter and lighter isotopes uh, we have warmer and warmer temperatures. And that's because the preference for the heavier isotopes uh, uh, to, to go into the calcium carbonate, that only really takes over at lower temperatures. Now, the, the, I guess the important thing to note here is that although for individual coral species, we do get these nice uh, linear uh, relationships, when you plot those all on the same uh, plot, we get a whole bunch of different calibration codes. So all over the shop. So although there is supposedly a kind of thermodynamic kind of basis for these, uh, this relationship between temperature and the oxygen isotopes of the, the coral carbonate, it turns out that that is slightly, um, I guess, messed up when you're looking at the differences between different species, because each different species of coral or each, maybe each individual different coral will have a slightly different kind of uh, fractionation as um, the isotopes get through basically the living part of the coral and through all of these different uh, biochemical processes. Um, so what we have to do is, is, is do an empirical calibration. Now this is um, uh, actually some calibrations made on uh, foraminifera rather than corals, but the same kind of uh, thing uh, applies. Uh, we grow the corals, or we'll grow in this case some foraminifera under different conditions, we'll go and sample them from the wild uh, where we can measure the water temperature. Uh, and then we're, what we're looking at here is the difference in the isotope ratio between water and calcium carbonate. So that's what's given in these, um, uh, these, uh, these uh, annotations here. So this is the delta 18O in the calcium carbonate minus the delta 18O in water. Uh, because depending on where we've sampled these from, the water isotope ratio might have been uh, changed because of the salinity uh, changing. Um, uh, and the temperature um, dependency on the isotope ratios in the calcium carbonate doesn't really know about the isotope composition of the water. But anyway, so we can produce calibration curves like this, which then allow us to use the oxygen isotopes to tell us something about um, so uh, let's have a, a quick kind of recap of where we've got with this. So I guess, first of all, the, the water oxygen isotopes, they're, they're not going to be the same as coral oxygen isotopes. And the difference between them will tell us something about the temperature at which that, that coral uh, formed its calcium carbonate. Um, uh, the water oxygen isotopes vary with salinity. Um, so if we could measure the water oxygen isotopes, that'd be great. We could use that as a proxy for salinity, but unfortunately, 
in the paleo record, in, 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 when we're looking at fossils, we don't have fossil water to measure. So we only have the corals. Um, and if we knew the difference between the oxygen isotope composition of the water and the corals, then we could calculate temperature. But again, we only have, annoyingly, we only have the coral. We don't have the water. No, no, we can only measure the calcium carbonate. So what are we going to do? Okay. And to cap to, 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 to add misery to our dilemma here, um, we don't know absolutely what the relationship is between um, the, the temperature difference and the isotope ratio because it's, it's different for every coral. So we'd, we'd have to we'd have to do a calibration uh, for every different species we wanted to use. Um, now. Uh, the good news is that um, if there is a change in salinity or a change in temperature, that should be reflected in the oxygen isotopes of the, of the coral. So uh, it's, it's, it's useful in that it's, it's telling us changes in the oxygen isotope ratio preserved in corals are at least telling us something. So here, here are some data um, collected actually by uh, Sandy uh, Tudhope. One of the other uh, lecturers, uh, I guess he's a professor uh, on the course. Um, uh, so uh, before we uh, crack on, I just just a, a little uh, word of, of caution. Uh, so here are uh, basically some samples that were measured in, in a coral. So the coral has been growing for a number of years. That we just Sandy's just sampled different layers in this coral and he's measured the oxygen isotopes. So you can see the delta 18 O over on this side. Um, this PDB is just the, the standard that's used for these measurements. But what I would like to draw your attention to is the, the vertical scale on this graph is upside down. OK, so you can see it goes minus 4.5 and then it goes to minus 5, which is less. That's higher up than minus 5.5. So this is quite a common uh, thing in uh, paleoclimate uh, research to, to flip the vertical axis upside down for oxygen isotopes. And the reason for that is that we like to think of as temperature being up. Um, so you'll remember, hopefully, that uh, as uh, the oxygen isotopes get progressively lighter, then we should go to higher temperatures. Okay? So um, we flip the axis upside down, so temperature is up. Uh, and if we look about what the, if the temperature was constant, how might changes in the uh, salinity of the water, how might that affect the oxygen isotopes that ultimately get preserved in the coral uh, by changing the water isotope composition that the coral is precipitating its calcium carbonate from? So you remember this graph over here where we've got this relationship in the tropics between um, oxygen isotopes and salinity. So when we have higher salinity, we have heavier. Uh, uh, oxygen isotopes. And when we have lower salinity, we have uh, lighter oxygen isotopes. So salinity uh, is going this way. Is that right? Have I got this wrong again? No. Yes. No. This is the wrong. I've got the arrow the wrong way up. Have I got the arrow the wrong way up? Let's think about this. Let's let's put the thinking hats on and fix the problem. So. Uh, if we have uh, a uh, word, um, yeah, so higher salinity is heavier delta 18 O. And on this graph, up is lighter isotopes. So I'm going to cross this out. And salinity is going this way. That, does that make sense? Does it? Mm. Yes. Yes. I think that does make sense. Um, yeah. This is, so uh, what we can see uh, from uh, this is that when um, we can we can think of as these oxygen isotope variations that we're seeing, not as being either maybe warm or cold or salty or fresh water. But a combination of the two. So when we have a low oxygen isotope uh, um, uh, ratio preserved in our corals, that could be due to it being uh, 
uh, hot. So up is hot. Or it could be due to this um, this 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 uh, this water here having a uh, low oxygen isotope ratio. So it could be fresh water. Fresh water. I'm gonna get rid of that. So fresh and warm and cool and salty. Okay, so uh, and this works quite well in, um, I guess, in the, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, tropics. Because if we actually have a look at some sea surface temperature and precipitation data, that's at the top here. When it is warm, okay, when we have uh, warm periods, some warm periods, warm period, uh, even these little warm period, warm period. When it's warm, it also tends to be wet. It's rain more. So these 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 peaks of, of wetness and warmness all match up. So um, we can then say that this um, oxygen isotopes or these oxygen isotope records preserved in these corals or this coral um, are not necessarily a proxy for temperature or salinity, but they're a proxy for both. And that's really useful in the tropics because those two parameters are so tightly coupled together. So we're looking at a proxy for uh, warm and wetness of, of the environment, although they're in the oceans. So the ocean is, of course, wet all the time. Um, but uh, how warm and, and rainy a, a region is. Um, so uh, we'll come on to uh, using our oxygen isotopes uh, nice types in coral with a little bit more detail uh, in, in a few other videos. Uh, but let's quickly have a look at carbon isotopes. So carbon, just like oxygen, has some isotopes. Um, it uh, has uh, fewer protons because uh, it's a different element, it has six protons. And then the most common form of carbon, carbon-12, that has six neutrons uh, in its nucleus. There's an isotope called carbon-13, that has one more, so it's a heavy isotope. So when we're looking at uh, variations, uh, in carbon isotopes, we quite often use delta 13C, which will be the ratio of carbon 13 divided by carbon 12 relative to some arbitrary standard. Um, there is also another isotope, carbon 14, that has an additional neutron uh, in its nucleus. Uh, that has, uh, it's, a, it's unstable, it has a, a half life of uh, just under 6,000 years. Uh, and we actually use this um, for dating things like corals and all kinds of archaeological stuff. Well, um, we'll, we'll come on to that in, in, a, in a future episode. Um, but we're just going to be looking at the, the stable isotopes of carbon uh, 12 and uh, 13. Uh, um, so just like uh, with water, uh, those carbon uh, isotopes can exchange between the different species. Um, they can't exchange between water because water doesn't have any carbon uh, in it, but we could maybe exchange between uh, calcium carbonate, our thing that's recording our proxy, and CO2 dissolved in the water. Um, again, it's not as simple as CO2 exchanges directly between the, um, or the or atoms from the CO2 they exchange directly with the calcium carbonate. They have to go through all of these other reactions here on the um, uh, uh, other side, right hand side. Um, uh, and they will only be exchanging as the mineral is growing, because again, the calcium carbonate is a solid mineral. Once it's formed, those, those atoms, those isotopes are kind of locked in. Um, uh, so carbon isotopes in corals are slightly more complicated because the uh, carbon can come from a variety of different sources. So the carbon can be out here dissolved uh, in the water, and that can be basically taken in into uh, basically little um, vacuoles inside a cell, which would then uh, be uh, transformed into bicarbonate, uh, which then make it to the um, site of calcification. But you'll remember from, uh, I guess, previous things, it could, could also be uh, from CO2 being formed uh, by respiration. Okay, so that's getting its carbon uh, via an additional set of processes, either through um, 
uh, uh, photosynthesis, taking carbon from the water, making sugars, which are then respired. So there's an additional process there, which might cause a nice temp fractionation. Or corals could be um, uh, basically uh, producing energy heterotrophically. So they could be filter feeding and their carbon could be respired from the food they're eating. Uh, and that ultimately then makes its way into the uh, site of calcification. Um, so that the uh, carbon that gets preserved in the skeleton uh, is a combination of the, the different sources that the coral is getting its carbon from, and also the fractionations that occur to that carbon as it makes its way through the coral uh, animal into, into the skeleton. Um, uh, and also, I just want to, uh, it's worth pointing out that, that, that corals are not just pure calcium carbonate, they have this organic uh, component. Uh, so there's the, obviously the organic component that you can see living on top of the coral, its polyps. But also within the skeleton itself, so this is a, a, maybe an experiment you might have done at school with any kind of like uh, bio mineral, in this case, appetite. So this is a, this is a tooth. Uh, and this is what happens to teeth when you uh, put them in coke uh, for a long amount of time. Uh, now, it's not, I guess the coke has somewhat dyed um, the, the tooth brown here. But actually, if you, if you do this experiment, and I guess if you knock someone's teeth out, um, this is a great uh, experiment to do to put you off drinking coke. Um, but when you do this, the, it hasn't just dyed the, the tooth, and I can't really show this on the screen because it's kind of, uh, well, I can't really find a video of it either, but it's kind of become spongy and, and gooey and horrible. And what's happened is that the, the in this case, the acid in the Coca-Cola uh, or other uh, carbonated brown beverages are available. Um, has actually dissolved away the hard mineral component and just left the organic part of the tooth behind. Uh, and corals, just like teeth, have an organic component bound within the hard mineral. Uh, and that organic component uh, is made up of carbon, but it's also made up of nitrogen. Uh, there'll be some phosphorus as well. I don't obviously care about phosphorus for isotope uh, geochemistry because phosphorus only has one stable isotope. So which is of no use to us. Um, but it has nitrogen in it, it has carbon in it, and we can use the isotope ratios of this organic component to tell us something else about uh, the coral and the environment that it lived in. Um, so here are some, some uh, images of a uh, part of coral skeleton to illustrate that, that there are this, this organic material um, uh, in, in the coral. So I guess we've got a photomicrograph on, on, on the left-hand side, and you can see this kind of dark, band going down the middle and from that you can see these needles of uh, aragonite radiating out uh, from that and it's this dark band in the middle that's really concentrated in organic material and we can see that in the fluorescence part can you see this fluorescent part so uh, and we can also see it in um, uh, this uh, spectroscopic data which shows the presence of uh, carbon hydrogen bonding which is basically the presence of organic matter and not in calcium carbonate because calcium carbonate does not have hydrogen. Um, so we can see these, 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 these concentrations of organic matter bound up within uh, the coral. And actually they're not just associated with the central part of the, the, the coral skeleton, they're, they're throughout the skeleton, lots of organic material. Um, uh, uh, and it's just an example of how we can use this with deep sea corals. So deep sea corals are obviously growing in the deep sea. So there's no photosynthesis this going on here? Uh, where are they getting their carbon from? Uh, uh, they must be getting their carbon, uh, I guess all their energy, uh, from um, feeding, uh, from heterotrophy. Uh, so this is an uh, example of, I think this is an octocoral or gorgonian coral, sorry. Um, uh, they grow uh, basically like just like a tree, these annual rings, and these annual rings are made up of, of organic carbon rich layers and, and inorganic carbon, so calcium carbonate uh, rich layers. Um, so we can, we can measure the, uh, the, the isotopes preserved in these different layers. Uh, and actually we can be a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, adventurous than just measuring the, the composition of the bulk organic carbon. Uh, there are techniques which are available now which allow us to, to take the organic components of the coral skeleton and actually try to separate out the different organic molecules um, so in this case, we're actually looking at uh, um, some uh, measurements of uh, specific amino acids, 
can be isolated and we can then measure the isotope compositions of, of those. And as it turns out here, that the, the kind of the science story is that actually the isotopic composition of the amino acids um, uh, stay relatively constant uh, uh, from when those amino acids were formed uh, by phytoplankton in the surface ocean, whereas the uh, bulk organic carbon uh, that has its isotope composition modified as it works its way up through the food web. And the, the lighter isotopes uh, get basically preferentially respired by um, uh, the organisms that, that are passing this carbon through their food webs, uh, leaving the, the basically the, the higher up you go to the food web, they get preferentially uh, enriched in, in the heavier isotopes or, or less depleted in the lighter isotopes. And that's what you can see in this group step. It's actually move up trophic level. Uh, we get in this case less negative, so heavier uh, isotopes. So we could we could uh, we've got basically got some, some measurements in in that coral uh, of uh, both the uh, bulk. So this is the, the bulk in the um, uh, the open triangles here, um, and uh, we got a measure of the uh, amino acid. Um, that's representing the surface ocean. Um, so what this is telling us here that, that actually in some periods, like here, the coral is almost exclusively getting all of its organic carbon from um, uh, organic material that's from the surface ocean. Um, so it's, it's uh, whereas in other periods, uh, some of the organic carbon is actually coming from somewhere else. Okay, so it might be being processed through the food web in a slightly different way intensively giving us uh, different kind of pathways of the carbon down to get to the bottom of the ocean. So it might be telling us something about the efficiency of the organic carbon pump, which you might remember back from the uh, video about how the ocean works. Uh, another example of, uh, of us using uh, this, this uh, organic component in corals, this is another uh, deep sea coral section three, you can see these kind of growth layers uh, in this coral. Um, sampled in the Gulf of Mexico, so the Mississippi River comes out here, I guess. Uh, it's sampled um, just down here, I think. Um, uh, and um, what uh, the authors of this paper have done is that they've uh, they've sampled uh, the uh, coral along this black uh, transect in the middle. And actually, what we're going to um, do is just look at a bit of the data from this section here. So going from the centre, the old part of the coral out towards the, the edge here. Um, and um, what they've got here is, so this, this nice colored thing is basically a, a map of, um, of, of, of this kind of rectangle uh, here. So imagine we've stretched this vertically. Um, so it's actually this thing here, right? So you can see as we move towards, this is the center, and this is the edge over here. And as we go from the center to the edge this way, the, uh, I guess they've measured the rhenium concentration uh, with uh, a laser. Uh, they've kind of zapped away the coral and the fragments that come off have gone into a mass spectrometer and measured the rhenium concentration. Um, uh, um, what that is telling us that as we move from the, the center, as we go from basically uh, a long time ago, 400 AD, uh, to I guess the year 2000, uh, the rhenium content of this coral has gone up. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, we can see that it's gone up actually most dramatically from basically 1900 to now. Uh, and what the what's thought that the reason for this this chemical change in the coral, the rhenium, that is due to um, the um, intensification of agriculture and the uh, intensification of coal mining in the United States. Um, and that has led to lots of basically coal dust and uh, mining waste making its way down the Mississippi River uh, and kind of increasing the rhenium concentration. So rhenium is quite concentrated in coal. Um, that has ended up uh, in these, uh, these corals. Now that's not really uh, what um, uh, the, the, this whole thing is all about. It's also quite interesting, I guess, that uh, there's an in, seemingly a minor intensification here in the year, uh, I guess, 
700 AD, which doesn't really make sense why there would be an increase in coal mining. Um, so there are maybe other processes that are, that are affecting these low level concentrations of rhenium uh, in, uh, in this region at this time. Um, speculate what those might be. Uh, but the actual interesting thing, is, well, to me, is actually the nitrogen isotope data. So that's these black data here, show a gradual increase here, and then a rapid increase up here. Uh, so this is telling us something about the nitrogen isotopes that are present in the water, uh, living above that coral, and those nitrogen isotopes then get incorporated into the um, phytoplankton that are growing in the Gulf of Mexico, which then sink down to the bottom and then the coral eats them. Uh, so what might cause the nitrogen isotope ratio uh, to change in the surface ocean of um, the Gulf of Mexico? So this could be a variety of, of, of reasons. It could be due to uh, changing uh, inputs of uh, fertilizer going into the ocean, changing the nutrient dynamics in terms of the inputs, uh, or it could be a change in the, in the amount of nutrients that are actually used up in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, um, potentially due to kind of too many nutrients being added uh, due to agricultural land. Um, so what's useful uh, to note here is that the, the coral uh, is preserving uh, a variety of different things going on. It's got the, 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 um, the hard calcium carbonate, which might be telling us something about the conditions where that coral is actually forming in terms of its chemistry maybe something about the, the, the carbon isotopes in, in the water, but the organic material, so these, the, the organic layers, they might be telling us something about the uh, oceanographic conditions in the surface ocean above, where that organic material is ultimately being kind of formed and then being exported down to the deep ocean and then eaten by the, the, the coral. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of uh, the end of the, the isotope uh, ratio part of this, uh, this, this, this talk. Thingy. I guess the video has been quite long, uh, but to summarize, uh, isotope ratios preserved in, in the hard parts of corals, in the, in the calcium carbonate, um, can be used for a proxy of uh, warmness and wetness, okay, but not warmness or wetness, warmness and wetness, um, and the uh, carbon isotopes in corals can tell us something about the, the things that those corals have been eating or how they've been gaining their carbon, how they've been producing their carbon. Uh, okay, so the, the next uh, video, we, we've talked about kind of oxygen isotopes, talked about carbon isotopes, uh, not yet talked about carbon-14, that's to come, fun times. Uh, but the next video we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at some of the, the, the different elements that can actually substitute in uh, for calcium. And we've also see, already seen uh, rhenium being used as a, as a proxy for, I guess, pollution. Uh, some of these other elements might, might tell us something about not just the water column kind of element concentrations of pollutants, might also tell us about the environmental conditions as well. So that's to come. Fun times. Uh, fun times to come. Yeah.